All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today for this um, session, our, our big session here on Wednesday of International Education Week. Um, International Education Week this year is focusing on sustainable development goals by the United Nations. Um, and this, um, this day's theme is sustainable cities and communities. And we are really lucky to have Dr. Delario Lindsay from our sociology department talking to us today about building the just city, sustainability, inclusion, and social urbanism of Medellin, Colombia. And so I'm going to give you a little introduction to Dr. Lindsay, and then I will let him take it away and tell you more about what he'll be telling us today. So Dr. Lindsay joined the Department of Sociology in the fall of 2017. And before coming to Marymount, Dr. Lindsay served as an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at Bethune Cookman University. He was an assistant professor and the social science point person in the interdisciplinary African World Studies program at William Patterson University. And Dr. Lindsay has presented at several international conferences and has undertaken research trips to the Federal Republic of Brazil and the Republic of South Africa to study local forms of urban inequality and community engagement. He focuses greatly on urban and community studies, race, social class, gender and sexuality, social movements, and social inequality. He also serves as the academic director for the Global Scholars Program here at Marymount, a program that aims to create citizens of the world and offers motivated students in all academic disciplines experiences to expand their global perspectives through unique and dynamic intercultural learning opportunities. Dr. Lindsay, in particular, emphasizes perspective taking and engagement in his approach to the global scholars. Most recently, Dr. Lindsay took his cities in the 21st century class to Medellin, Colombia, with one of our global classroom series courses, where students engaged with local comunas, attended lectures, lectures at local universities, and explored the local culture. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Lindsay. Thank you, uh, uh, Anna Sophia, for that. Uh, welcome all four, all three of you, right? Uh, uh, this is uh, a great opportunity and I, I definitely appreciate uh, uh, everyone showing up. Um, I'm, I'm going to treat this like a, a family uh, vacation slideshow. You know, like, you know, you go on vacation and you can take a bunch of pictures, some of them interesting, most not. Uh, I, I, I promise that I have uh, edited out all of the uninteresting shots uh, and I have added uh, what I hope to be some interesting discussion, a little bit about myself uh, uh, to add, I can't add on to uh, uh, Anna Sophia's introduction, which was great. Um, but I, I consider uh, like a lot of times folks uh, throw around the word, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> throw around the word expert, right? Um, when they talk about uh, particularly uh, subjects of interest for academics and I, and, and I, and I but that's fine, but I don't consider myself an expert per se. I consider myself as someone who has a profound interest uh, uh, in, uh, in this instance in cities and uh, what they are, uh, how they are lived and what they can be. Um, and, and hopefully um, this presentation will provide you with some inspiration and some insight, obviously, uh, into the possibilities of, of, of the city. Uh, so so am, I, am I, I'm not sharing right now, but I'm, I'm like the main person, right? Yes. Okay, cool. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. All right, and play. And play. All right, uh, so move this out of the way. Uh, uh, the title of today's, today, the title of today's, what is going on with this thing? Hold on for a second. The title of today's discussion, uh, uh, Building the Just City, uh, uh, Sustainability, Inclusion, and uh, I'm sorry, uh, in the, social, the Social Urbanism of, of Medellin. Right, and this is and this is an image. This isn't one of my pictures. Uh, this is a picture that I borrowed from uh, EPM, which is the uh, power company uh, that is um, headquartered uh, uh, in Medellin, and we'll talk about that in a second. But this is one of the pictures from one of the places that uh, our class did visit 
Uh, we didn't visit it at night. Uh, uh, and this is a stupendously beautiful uh, um, introduction to some of the possibilities that we'll be discussing uh, in today's uh, little talk here. All right. Uh, <clears throat> this is a quote from uh, Aaron Wright. And Aaron Wright, this, like, this is a song about, like, I think it's a song about, um, like, a broken relationship or something like that. Right. But I like this quote because it has a lot of different alternative meanings. And I think one of the meanings to uh, that could be assigned to this quote, you always build it better the second time around, right, uh, is, is one that we can apply uh, to a discussion, a serious discussion about uh, uh, the cities uh, that we live in, the cities uh, that will um, be the main uh, sources of habitus for most people on the planet in the future. And, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, some of the problems that they're dealing with now, but also what they can be if we, you know, we as a community, we as, uh, uh, you know, citizens or the people that live in these cities, uh, take it upon ourselves to build something better, right? So I like that song, but, you know, this quote is, is, is interesting as well. All right, so I want to start out by sort of talking about, or in this instance, uh, providing context for uh, this broader idea of, of cities as important geographies, cities as important social contexts, uh, cities as places where uh, folks live, uh, uh, work, cities uh, as the uh, predominant, uh, uh, you know, place uh, or, or, or I guess you could say uh, habitus or the predominant uh, living arrangement for human beings on the planet moving forward. Right. Uh, the idea is to sort of focus on how uh, our planet is urbanizing. Right. Uh, and it is very much changing the face of the planet. This is a has been a process that's been in, uh, going on and taking place, you know, arguably for thousands of years. But over the last hundred or so years, rapid urbanization uh, has been a feature uh, of development uh, uh, and expansion of the human community. Uh, uh, you know, again, around, uh, around the world, right? As of, uh, as of 2019, 50, 56% of the world's population uh, 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 resides in or around uh, uh, cities uh, in some form or fashion, right? And, and we can say uh, that in general terms, when we think about urbanization, we're thinking uh, about urbanization as it occurs in what we consider to be the richer countries of the world or the most developed countries in the world, uh, it, you know, the, there, there's always this sort of tension and misnomer about this idea of development. Every country in the world is developing, even the United States or the EU. Development is this process that all nations undergo. We have most developed and least developed or less developed countries. And when we think about urbanization, we tend to focus on those richer countries because we you know these big cities, New York, Paris, London, or whatever the case may be, right? But moving forward, right? And we're talking just over the next couple, uh, 10 years or so, 60% of the growth that will occur in cities right, around the world will be occurring in cities in those developing nations or those less developed nations, right? And some of the numbers that, uh, uh, you know, uh, global, you know, bodies and, and you know, various initiatives, uh, uh, you know, sort of throw around the ones that are interested in this are talking about uh, specifically China, India, and Nigeria as being the places where most of the growth in cities will occur between now and 2050, right? Uh, 2050 is a big date for a lot of demographers and a lot of people that study population changes uh, uh, here in the U.S., but also around the world, right? Uh, so we're talking about how our planet, and I'll use the big term planet, is becoming a, a, a more urban planet and how this growth in urban populations uh, as of now is taking place in those countries that are still developing, those countries that are that, that tend to have, uh, I guess you can frame it, you can frame development in many different ways, but in this instance, we can frame it in terms of having fewer resources, right? Uh, uh, you know, in terms of their uh, ability to uh, expand their economies, uh, as the case may be currently. And again, you know, the future uh, will tell a different story. But as of now, developing nations are growing, uh, and their urban populations specifically. Are growing uh, uh, tremendously. As of 2018, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, as of 2018, nearly about 24, a little over 24% of the world's urban population 
lives in either informal settlements or uh, uh, slums, right? Uh, and we'll, we'll take a closer look at what those features are and what specifically is meant by an informal settlement and a slum, but we're talking uh, 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 primarily about folks living in uh, what would what, what be considered substandard living conditions or uh, situations where there are different types of precariousness, right? Uh, uh, and we're talking about uh, the ways in which the the world's urban poor are housed, uh, and these housing situations tend to be pretty, uh, 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 you know, they're 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 they the folks who live in these situations make do, but uh, there is certainly uh, room for improvement, uh, and there's certainly a lot of room to make these uh, uh, housing situations that folks are are dealing with more uh, uh, livable. Sorry about that. Right. So when we think about questions uh, related to this, you know, one of the, you know, I guess the, the overarching sort of themes of today's talk uh, is sustainability and sustainable urbanism and development, right? Uh, one of the things that we must address when we talk about sustainability and, and, and particularly in urbanization uh, is uh, what cities are doing, for example, what cities uh, and this big, you know, more than 50% of the population, right, already living in cities are doing uh, to, the, to the climate and the uh, environment, uh, particularly the local environment, regional environment in which they are uh, uh, positioned, right? Uh, 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 the types of resources that are being used by cities, right? And again, broader questions about uh, what cities can be seen as uh, 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 making changes or the types of models that can come out of cities uh, to create uh, greater uh, amounts and degrees of sustainability moving forward. All right, so uh, the first thing that, you know, we should touch on uh, is uh, the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals, right? So, you know, in 2015, the United Nations uh, implemented, uh, I think there's like 18 or 19 or something like that, what they refer to as Sustainable Development Goals which from the perspective of the UN and all of the various uh, signatories to the UN uh, represents uh, a, uh, a path forward to create a, a climate stable planet uh, uh, through uh, concerted human efforts to you know, combat uh, uh, the environmental effects and some of the uh, consequences, looming consequences associated with, with climate change, right? Uh, there were a bunch of different development goals uh, uh, having to do with anything from, you know, social inequality to housing, right? Uh, uh, but all of them have a, a, a particular focus on uh, how uh, efforts can be made uh, within nations and within communities even uh, to deal with the subject of, of climate change. And the one that is most pertinent for our discussion here is uh, this, uh, uh, the uh, S, uh, SDG number 11 which is the one that focuses primarily on cities, right? And this is the text of it. This is, this is pretty much the goal. The goal is very straight, simple. I mean, straight, straightforward, very simple, right? Uh, make cities inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable, right? Uh, uh, how that's gonna be done, right? You know, even though it's very succinct, right? Uh, 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 is, you know, you know the, the problem or, or you know, one of, the, one of the issues that has to be addressed. But the fact that this goal is so succinct and very sort of to the point, is quite, you know, from my perspective, quite amazing, right? In the sense that uh, what it is saying is that cities are important spaces, will continue to be important spaces to us, us as people on this planet. And we have to, as a goal, make sure that the cities that we have and the cities that we will be building in the future as they grow and expand are inclusive, right? Are, are spaces of, of, of diversity, are spaces uh, that are accepting uh, uh, of all the city's residents and whoever would come to the city or whether they would be there to live, work or, or you know, play, whatever the case may be, that cities are safe. And by that safe, by that I mean safe for everyone, right? Uh, 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 you know, one of the ways in which we can sort of structure an understanding of how social inequality manifests itself uh, can be oddly enough around issues like safety, right? Uh, one of the things that uh, money can uh, buy you uh, uh, in this world is uh, security, right? And, and one of those things that a lot of people, particularly those living in those uh, um, 
informal communities may not have on a day-to-day -day basis is security or safety. Resilient, and then this is uh, again having to do with being able to withstand uh, uh, the impact of what more and more climate scientists are sort of making the case will be inevitable uh, uh, climate consequences, right? But these are these should, these cities that we build, that these, these cities that we are imagining in the future should be able to withstand uh, uh, some of these climate impacts. Uh, and the, the, the biggest idea would be to make these cities sustainable, uh, create a situation where the cities we make aren't contributing to the problem, but in some instances might be even solutions to the problem of climate change moving forward. And that would be a fantastic uh, situation. Uh, you also have the UN and uh, a, a separate sort of um, uh, um, set of doctrines that they put out, uh, the new urban agenda in 2016, <coughs> which is basically trying to uh, convince uh, municipal governments around the world uh, to uh, adopt the spirit of the uh, SDG number 11 and come up with ways to implement it uh, on a local level in their towns. And one of the one of the interesting things about the new urban agenda from my perspective is that it kind of invites uh, uh, communities and cities around the world to be creative about what they do in terms of the type of development that they want to achieve, right? Uh, it, it, it says that uh, some of the best answers and solutions are those that can be found on a local level, right? And I, and I think that's an important message to put out there. And we also have to think about how important cities are currently, in, and they would probably be even more so in the future, <clears throat> excuse me, spaces of development, right? Or engines driving development for uh, a nation, so a nation city. Uh, uh, if we use the example of Nigeria, uh, Lagos is the commercial capital of Nigeria, can also be thought of as the developmental engine or part of the developmental engine of, of, of that expanding uh, uh, developing nation. As Nigeria uh, gets richer, becomes richer, uh, the, the, the world city of Lagos will be an instrumental part uh, in uh, generating wealth for uh, uh, the Nigerian people moving forward. I don't know why it keeps doing that. Okay. Apparently, I just have to push the next step. All right. A World City Report uh, uh, on uh, on the value of uh, sustainable urbanization had four key points that I that I wanted to to sort of address and sort of have you look at today, right? Um, and in this instance, we're talking uh, about. Uh, uh, the value of particular types of qualities or attributes that cities should have moving forward, right? Uh, uh, one of the values the urbanization, again, should be inclusive to all groups uh, uh, that live in the city. And then we sort of touched on that, right? Uh, another value uh, that should be, uh, uh, or another goal or another uh, uh, concept that should be pursued uh, is related to what government should do. And government should move from this idea of equality to the idea of equity, right? And in this instance, <coughs> we're talking about equality in terms of sort of seeing everybody, uh, uh, you know, as equals as they live uh, uh, and work and thrive in the city, right? But equity uh, is this idea of putting everybody on equal footing. And in this instance, we're talking about some of the things that governments have to purposely sort of do to go into those places that have been historically uh, 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 cast aside, left out, uh, 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 ignored and do what they can to bring those communities up to the level where the more affluent and more uh, developed sections of the city are, right? So there is a difference between e equality and equity. And the UN is making a case that cities, as they are managed, as they move forward and they think about some of the things that they need to do in order to uh, uh, create sustainable urban environments, need to move toward uh, uh, equity. Uh, and this idea of removing uh, what they refer to as uh, systemic barriers. Right, uh, environmental value of sustainable urbanization uh, again cannot be uh, realized from their perspective what, well, without uh, tending to the needs and including those who have been the most disadvantaged populations within cities. In a sense that the idea of sustainable urbanization is not something that should be associated with the activities of elites and, the, and for the benefit of elites, it should be something that is dispersed throughout the community and have everyone uh, with buy-in and ownership of this process uh, and benefits uh, associated with these processes should be uh, spread uh, throughout, the, uh, uh, throughout the community. Right, uh, and this other point, this is an interesting point too, urban greening, initi greening initiatives right, uh, enhance the overall value of urbanization, but must not 
uh, exacerbate inequality or social vulnerability in the sense that uh, uh, the cost of uh, sustainability projects should not be borne uh, by those who are the most disadvantaged in the city, which is a fantastic point. Right. Uh, so, so one, and, and this is just my ranting here, right? So one of the things that comes to my mind when I think about inequality or urban inequality in the 21st century uh, uh, has to do, uh, uh, if, we th if we think about how inequality is expressed, right? Uh, I think about inequality being expressed uh, uh, in the form of social distance and not the social distance associated with uh, COVID, obviously. Uh, but in this instance, we're talking about social distance associated with uh, 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 the you know, access to resources. We're talking about stratification. Right here, you know, uh, based on class, uh, based on racial ethnic identity, based on a number of features uh, that are uh, a structuring of life in cities, and also spatial distance, right? And one of the things that we'll see when we get a look, at, when we really get into our sort of discussion about Medellin, is the ways in which the various communities, middle class, upper class, and and the poor communities, are separated uh, in very 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 distinctive ways, right? And one of the problems that that, that had to be overcome uh, uh, within the Medellin model. The many model was the <clears throat> the overcoming the social distance and the spatial distance uh, between the various communities, right? Uh, uh, from my perspective, the global process of urbanization uh, 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 is driven is driven by uh, uh, many different factors, right? right? You know, in the sense that you know there are lots of things <laughs> that cause urbanization to occur, right? And one of the things, from my perspective, that is related to uh, uh, urbanization is displacement of various types. Right, as to say, uh, uh, typically uh, uh, city scholars or urban sociologists uh, describe these push and pull forces, right? These are forces that would push people to the city, right? Um, uh, you know, and, and some of these push forces could be thought of as displacement and you have these other uh, um, uh, pull forces that, you know, like economic um, uh, forces that are uh, pulling people into the city. And, and my stupid dictation wrote the word by B-Y-E, all right, don't, please don't think that I wrote that, the dictation did that. I don't know what's going on. So displacement uh, by wars and other forms of conflict uh, can be uh, thought of as a force uh, contributing to urbanization. Displacement by, and again, by uh, uh, industrial or commercial activity, right? Uh, uh, what comes to mind would be some of the uh, various ways in which indigenous communities, particularly in South America, are ha having to deal with conflicts with uh, uh, with both uh, agricultural corporations and mining corporations as they are being pushed off their land in various ways. And we also have displacement by environmental disruption or calamity, right? And that, and that last one will be a very, very prominent feature for many parts of the world moving forward as climate change really takes hold and we start to see the more extreme consequences and effects of that, right? Uh, and another point, uh, urban inequality uh, is often expressed particularly uh, uh, in the developing world is often, often expressed as uh, precarious living conditions. As to say, uh, the urban poor uh, not only tend to live in these uh, houses or structures that are uh, you know, not up to snuff in terms of their quality, but they also tend to live in arguably very dangerous parts of the city in terms of the geography of the city, right? Near floodplains, near slopes that can, once saturated with water, uh, lead to various types of mudslides, right? So, so uh, uh, that is another way in which uh, we can think about social inequality in the city uh, uh, manifesting itself as urban, urban inequality. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Medellin model, and I'll put in a question mark there, right? The Medellin model, right? This has some, this handsome chap here is uh, Pablo Escobar, probably the most famous paisa, is that, is that the, the, the phrase for people from Medellin? That everybody knows pa uh, uh, um, Pablo Escobar. He was associated with a, an era uh, in Colombia uh, uh, and particularly uh, Medellin, which is his hometown, broadly speaking, uh, 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 specifically addressing uh, the, uh, the drug uh, uh, economy. And he was sort of the godfather of the drug economy. Uh, but the Medellin model doesn't address you know, the effects or uh, the, the life history of uh, pa uh, Pablo Escobar. The Medellin model uh, is a model of urban development uh, that uh, uh, you know, seeks to have uh, the city thrive and in many ways, this in spite of all of the things that occurred uh, 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 in, in, in the 20th century around uh, the drug economy. So from Escobar to escalators, right? And this is a, very, this is a picture from a very, very famous community 
uh, uh, community, uh, uh, Treso or Comuna 13 uh, in uh, one of the uh, less developed areas of, of Colombia. All right, so when we think about this Medellin model, we have to first sort of come to terms with a couple of things. Uh, the way that the city is sort of politically or, or in terms of the jurisdictions laid out, right? You have these uh, communas, right? And I think there are, it's supposed to be 17, there's 16, 16 communas, right? Are, are, are just neighborhoods, you might think of them as neighborhoods. They have numbers, uh, but they also have names, right? Uh, uh, so the, the communa that I just mentioned, Community 13, is also known as San Javier, right? Uh, uh, one of the most um, uh, affluent com communas is uh, El Pablado, right? Uh, uh, it's, you know, it's a place where you have lots of uh, upper middle class uh, uh, um, uh, residents living, right? And <clears throat> one of the ways in which we can think about a Medellin model working is uh, by again, seeing uh, just how spread out the, uh, uh, the city is uh, uh, in terms of where uh, the various residents live. And by various, I mean, uh, the various residents based on socioeconomics, uh, uh, you know, based on any, you know, various measures uh, that could lead to or could be associated with social inequality. But we also have to understand that Medellin as a city exists within a valley in a mountain range, right? So the city of Medellin uh, is in the Andes mountains and it, and it itself is in a valley, right? So if you look at this other photo here, you can see not just how spread out it is, but just how how you know ge geographically complex it is, right? So the 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 center of the image is obviously the central business district, right? The the center of the city, but you also have like everything that you can see there, right? All of those uh, uh, structures going up the, the the hillside. That's all Medellin, right? That's all the city, right? But it is it's it's just geographically sort of you know different in terms of how it's laid out. And that can pose, uh, the geography of it uh, can or has posed problems, particularly when it comes to people getting around from one part of the city to the next, right? And again, uh, as we address or process understanding of the Medellin model, that's one of the uh, goals uh, that the Medellin model was seeking to address. All right, All right so uh, the movement towards social urbanism, right? So when we think about social urbanism, we're thinking about uh, a, a particular uh, um, policy approach, and again, it was uh, most uh, associated with uh, uh, three mayors, right? Successive mayors beginning terms in uh, 2000. Uh, I think uh, the first mayor was uh, Luis Perez, right? Uh, going all the way uh, to uh, 2011. And I think that last mayor's last name was Salazar, right? Uh, implementing uh, these, po these policies that we would sort of come to know as many uh, social urbanism. Like social urbanism as an idea, uh, uh, this idea of sort of focusing on uh, of those, those communities most in need uh, uh, first uh, uh, existed before Medellin. I think there was even a Spanish model of social urbanism. Uh, but was, what's key here is how Medellin was able to take the model and make it its own. <clears throat> Focus on healing the trauma caused by years of violence, right? Just before, uh, 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 around uh, 2000, uh, there were lots of military um, engagements uh, uh, around the city that finally, uh, after a very long time, cleared out uh, uh, various types of militia and, and guerrilla groups that were fighting uh, in and around the city and the federal government came in and pushed them out. Uh, uh, and uh, it was tremendous amounts of violence for years before that. And one of the points of social urbanism was to begin the process of healing uh, the city from that trauma, right? And also uh, obviously to promote uh, a greater social equity amongst the various communities. And again, you saw how spread out and, and they, they are, right? And the local government developed uh, uh, this uh, enterprise for urban development, which is you know, basically a community uh, development corporation, right? To uh, design, plan, and implement uh, the various projects that are associated with social urbanism, right? <clears throat> so the primary focus of social urbanism, broadly speaking, uh, is related to this idea of urban integration, sort of you know, bring the city back together Right, transportation, making it easier for people to move around the city, and also a focus on sustainability and livability. Right, uh, the two most prominent uh, solutions uh, uh, associated with this uh, idea would be the PUIs, which are uh, urban uh, integration or urban or, or urban uh, integra integral urban projects. I guess right uh, is another thing about it, uh, and the life articulation units. Right, so the PUIs are technically 
uh, because of the time frame, uh, the Puvis are the ones that are most associated with the idea of, of social urbanism, uh, whereas the Uvas, which came later, uh, are inspired by uh, uh, social urbanism, right? Uh, so the Puvis, <coughs> right, uh, are probably the most visible expressions of social urbanism, right? If you, as you see it uh, uh, around the various parts of the city, right? So each of these locations are locations that I had the pleasure uh, of touring uh, 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 with students or uh, with the uh, director of, of the CGE, uh, 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 Victor, uh, at one point or another, right? Uh, and each of these PUIs uh, uh, represents uh, effort on the part of the city uh, to solve uh, one of those problems, either a problem of integration, right? Either it's a problem of sustainability, right? So if we look at the Juan Bobo Canal, uh, this was a canal that when it rained too hard, uh, it would flood and it would, you know, people's houses in these communities and these are precarious sort of living conditions would be flooded. Uh, uh, we have the Metro Cable, which is a solution that was developed to overcome uh, the difficulties of people living in the sort of far flung communities, being able to take advantage of the Metro system. The Metro system in, in, in Medellin, Colombia had been around since the mid nineties, but it was very difficult for folks living in the hillsides to actually get access to it, right? Uh, uh, and here you have, uh, the Spain Library, which I think is still closed, right? Um, but the library uh, is this architectural wonder uh, uh, that is uh, not in a downtown area, not in the central business district or that fancy part of town, El, El Poblado. It is in, uh, uh, I think this would be Comuna Uno, which is one of the historically one of the more, one of the poorest neighborhoods uh, in the city, and it's this marvel. You know, your architecture magazines of all all around the world have talked about it as this beautiful example of modern architecture, and it is effectively in the hood, right? As to say, this idea of urban integration, uh, 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 putting first uh, those communities that have been uh, ignored or uh, 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 less considered, uh, uh, you know, at the front of the line uh, for these uh, different types of projects. Right, and of course <laughs> we have uh, Community 13 or Community 13, and Community 13 is uh, known uh, uh, for two things. It was known as one of the most violent neighborhoods in Medellin, uh, particularly during a time when the, the violence uh, associated with the uh, guerrillas and the militias uh, uh, was was prominent, uh, and it, now it is one of the most heavily toured areas of Medellin uh, because of the social urbanism projects that were that are uh, currently uh, on display here. And there are new ones being built uh, all the time. I think there's a new UBA that is uh, being built uh, in Camino Tres. Uh, uh, and it's, it's, it's a wonderful place to visit. Uh, Victor and I toured it <coughs> last year. Um, uh, and one of the examples of social urbanism, as I say, uh, uh, when we think about uh, what government, local government, municipal government can do when it puts people first, is the is the fact that and the, and the escalators have been there since I think 20, 2009 or something like that, and in recent years they put these coverings to make the escalators, um, uh, you know, all weather, right? But the idea is to make life easy for folks or easier for folks, right? Uh, 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 and have them stay in their communities if they if they want to stay in their communities is, is a, a sort of weird sort of understanding of development in place in the sense that. What the city could do if it wanted to, or if it thought about doing it, would be to, <clears throat> excuse me, move all of these folks to, you know, modern houses somewhere or whatever the case may be, uh, farther away from the city, right? Uh, farther even than they already are, right? Uh, uh, but the city chose to not displace anybody, right? Uh, and to have people stay in their community, stay in their homes, and just make life for them where they are uh, uh, easier. Right, and it also created all types of economic opportunities for folks uh, uh, in this community. There are all these businesses that popped up uh, as a as a result of the community being made safe, as a community being made a model, right, uh, uh, as a community being made uh, again uh, far more livable uh, than it was. Right, uh, the Uvas, right. Uh, I wish uh, my good friend uh, Matt Dr. Barker were here because he would be able to pronounce this perfectly. Right, but I'm going to pronounce it in my LA non Spanish accent. Quitar uh, la cerca para estar más cerca. Right, we move the fence to be closer. Right, and this is a quote taken from uh, uh, EPM 
which is the electric company, the, uh, the municipal electric company that funds a lot of these projects. And, and again, the UVAs are a later time period. They're not technically in that, that period associated with social urbanism, but they are inspired by it, right? Uh, and <clears throat> this is the result of a particular type of public-private partnership um, uh, where uh, uh, this electric company or this uh, electric and water utility uh, uses its own land to create uh, uh, vibrant uh, uh, community spaces uh, uh, for the various neighborhoods uh, and communities in Medellin. All right, uh, the, the UBA stands for Articulated Life Units, right? And what you see here are just some examples of some of the UBAs that are spread around the city. Right, and they're, in, you know, and in, 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 uh, they're, they're concentrated, they tend to be concentrated in those communities that are, that have been historically underserved, right? Uh, they use, again, uh, they tend to focus on uh, the, these, the round things there are water storage units. And what they do is build parks or community centers in and around those water storage units, right? The goals of the articulated life units uh, uh, to develop a dynamic space for culture, recreation and leisure, right? Using the, the lots uh, of these, uh, the, the, the electric company, uh, and their and their water storage units to use light energy and by energy I think they mean movement right water and the natural environment to build a sense of connection and belonging for those underserved communities to encourage community uh, ownership uh, in the care and use of these spaces right as I say these the uh, the, the it's it's not a, a magnanimous act it is a communitarian act for the company to say uh, you are us and we are you. This is your space as much as it is ours. Use them, take care of them. We are in this together, right? Uh, and to promote social inclusion. Uh, and again, uh, a greater uh, a sense of corporate uh, responsibility, particularly as it has to do with issues of, of community building and sustainability, right? Uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the UBAs are again, uh, these uh, sort of public private partnerships, right? They provide green space. Uh, a lot, uh, uh, many of the UBAs have within them uh, community centers that are used by local residents uh, for after school programs. They're, the one that we visited had a daycare in it, right? Uh, uh, for community residents, right? Uh, uh, there are, uh, in some instances, uh, athletic fields associated with UBAs, right? So these are spaces, uh, you know, community centers, but also spaces of various types of congregation, right? Uh, the class that I went, uh, the class that I went to a, a center in Morovia, and Morovia is more of a, pu uh, a pui, right? But it, ha it had one of these sort of structures that was uh, the heart of the community. It was, it was the heart of the community. It was a fantastic place where all the, the young people would hang out and go after school, right? And also brings, uh, uh, it creates opportunities for recreation and outdoor living, right? And it brings modern design and architecture uh, to these communities, makes it available to all. All right. So this is one of the UBAs that uh, the, my uh, most recent uh, Cities in the 21st Century class visited in Colombia, and this would have been in March, right? Uh, this is Comuna, uh, Comuna Ocho or Comuna 8. Uh, uh, and each of the UBAs has a name, right? So this is the UBA of the imagination, right? Uh, we, didn't get, we didn't get a chance to see it at night, but as you can see, it is fully integrated into this neighborhood uh, and it is fully used. People love it. All right, here's another shot of it, both in day and at night. All right. This is uh, my Sociology 395, uh, Cities in the 21st Century course, uh, being toured around. And this is the inside of that over, over uh, uh, where the daycare and the classrooms are and the community center is. And we're, when we're, being, uh, uh, we're being sort of shown around and, and uh, someone is discussing the various things that the UVA does. All right. Now, this is the outdoor stage area uh, of that Uber. There's an outdoor stage so that you can have the theatrical presentations and whatnot uh, uh, in that space, All right? Uh, this is Uber La Libertad, uh, also in Comuna Ocho. Uh, and this was, again, centering around a water tank. <clears throat> uh, it is, again, as you can see from the picture here, fully, you know, in place and ensconced in this community. It is a part of the community. Right, and our, our guide uh, was very, very quick to point out that since the Uber was built, businesses, very, you know, small businesses, community, you know, household businesses, have sprung up in the neighborhood uh, uh, as a means of sort of taking advantage of the foot traffic, 
uh, as a means of, of uh, you know, as I guess you could say, as an offshoot of uh, the refocus on these neighborhoods uh, uh, and the vitality that was already there. Right. This is a, a, an image of the architecture that you would find in some of these uvas. Another picture of my class, and we're on top of the uh, the dome there, this spiral. I don't know how they got my camera, actually. I don't know who took this picture. Somebody got my phone and took this picture because that's I wasn't even in the picture. I don't know, whatever. Right. So uh, one of the things that we should think about, you know, broadly speaking, and sort of wrap it up, is there a place for justice and equity in urban development, right? And what the Medellin model uh, or the Medellin example shows me uh, is that there definitely is, right? Uh, uh, in, in, in the sense that you can think about both building a city, uh, uh, a sustainable city, a, a city uh, that uh, doesn't contribute to the problems uh, of the world, particularly as it has to do with climate change, right? And also uh, contributes mightily uh, to justice and equity uh, uh, for, uh, uh, in, the, in the lives of everyday people as they live and inhabit the city, right? Uh, this uh, sort of focuses on the importance of political will Right, in the sense that you have to have, and I think this is one of the things that the UN is sort of stressing with the new urban agenda, you have to have local administrations that are willing to take the plunge, that are willing to make the call, that are willing to uh, make the hard choices uh, uh, in favor of uh, uh, greater equity and favor of greater justice uh, when it comes to uh, building out or building up uh, their cities. Uh, it points to the importance of inclusion of community voices, the UVAs, and the Puis had uh, 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 you know, enormous amounts of community participation in a sense that many of the, de the, the designs of the UVAs in particular uh, uh, had uh, uh, community members uh, uh, you know, having their say on how these things would look and how they would fit in the community, right? Uh, uh, in a sense that these, these, the voices of these, uh, of these uh, community members, these communities, that were ignored or, or seldom considered or, or thought of in, in, in terms of an afterthought were not ignored, they were included. They were considered to be uh, vitally important uh, in this process of making these neighborhoods uh, or, or building up these neighborhoods. So it's the importance of design, obviously. Uh, uh, you know, here we're talking about the architecture uh, uh, and again, the way in which concern and consideration for the environment is built into the design and what's, uh, most amazing to me is the uh, the beauty of this architecture, right? Uh, you know, the pictures don't do it justice. The beauty of this architecture, sort of rising out of these communities, uh, uh, you know, and, and these are communities that are uh, again, these are you know, relatively low-income communities have some of the best architecture in the city of Medellin, you know, as their park or as their playground or as their recreation field or their community center, right? And to me, that's that's Magnificent, right? In the sense that, you know, when you think about what draws people to a city, right? You think about those things that are typically associated with areas of the city that are associated with privilege, right? Or associated with high income or whatever the case may be. But in Medellin, they've created all types of draws or, you know, you know these sort of magnets that are spread throughout the city and particularly in those parts of the city uh, uh, that are, uh, uh, that have historically been uh, 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 unconsidered or, or not thought of. And again, this is a, a, a wonderful way of thinking about this idea of equity, right? And lastly, this idea of homegrown uh, best practices and models. Uh, again, the idea of social urbanism isn't new. Many, the, the folks in Medellin didn't invent it, but they took it and made it their own, right? And then another way of thinking about that is that when we look around the world uh, uh, for, for ways to create sustainable, equitable cities, uh, we don't always have to look to those developed nations. We don't always have to look to the, the US or, or to the Netherlands or whatever the place may, these places that we typically associate with uh, you know, cutting edge urban development. We can look to places like Medellin, right? Uh, that have, uh, again, uh, all of these characteristics, you know, a, a, a desire uh, to build a new city or a, a more inclusive city, the political will uh, and the, uh, the support of the people uh, to do that. Uh, you can find uh, a good uh, uh, urban planning, urban development, and, and community building anywhere in the world, right? And, and I think uh, the Medellin model uh, uh, definitely uh, demonstrates that, at least from my perspective. All right, thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate you, um, you know, 
educating this on uh, educating us on sustainability and building a just city. And we wanted to take this chance to open it up to questions um, to if you would like to send in your questions anonymously because we are recording or if you are comfortable, you are welcome to also um, unmute yourself or I can unmute you and we you can ask Dr. Lindsay your questions. Matt, Dr. Bacher is here. I see. I wonder if Matt, Dr. Bacher has a question. Does Matt, Dr. Bacher have a question? Well, in the meantime, I, I do have a question. What are, do you find that any cities after some of your research you've been to, um, you know, you've looked at this in, in Medellin, but I also know that you've been to Brazil and South Africa and then um, just even within the US, are you seeing a few other cities that you think have done this, not necessarily to the same level, but that you mm. see some of the same practices or similar practices and outcomes in other cities? And what are some of those practices that you've seen? I, 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 I would say that the, the, Medi the Medellin situation, the Medellin model, and, and one of the reasons why you sort of put a question mark by the Medellin model is uh, that the city is very, very special uh, in that you had uh, this, you know, it was, I don't know if it was a political party, but you know, those three mayors that are most responsible for sort of getting social urbanism off the ground, were progressives, right? Uh, and and you know the first mayor sort of got it off the ground, and then the, the, another mayor came in, and instead of scrapping the project, he built on it, right? And then after him, another mayor came in and built you know built on it even more, right? So that's kind of like a, a, a you know a special sort of situation in terms of having uh, a successive uh, successive administrations uh, have that. Uh, as a priority, have that type of development as a priority. And also Medellin is in a special situation because it has this, this uh, EPM, this, this power company, right? Which generates tons and tons and tons of revenue. It's basically a state-owned company, right? A city-owned company uh, that generates tons and tons of revenue uh, for uh, Antioquia, which is the state that Medellin is in, uh, but also you know, for the city, uh, which meant that uh, the city was in a position uh, to you know, you know, you know, call its own shots because it, it had it had financial resources to pursue uh, some of these uh, uh, programs, right? So in the Medellin case is kind of a special case in that way. But what you, you know, what you can see are similarities in terms of the different types of community agency, right? In, in the sense that what you can see consistently in various places around the world, uh, 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 you know, I saw the same or similar situations in in Johannesburg, right? And in the way in which uh, there are uh, uh, community agents, people in the communities uh, that make demands, right? And these are viable uh, and reasonable demands uh, of state and local government uh, to pay attention to these neighborhoods that have been long ignored, right? And, and so if you want to think about a consistency in terms of, of uh, you know, models, and I don't really like that language model. I think people use the word models, you know, because it's, it's, it's sort of an easy shorthand uh, for uh, a set of priorities or set of outcomes or whatever the case may be, right? And, and, and the reality, none of this stuff is necessarily easy, right? You know, so, so I think what you find as consistent would be uh, the agency on the part of the community, right? Uh, in the sense that it wasn't just these politicians that, you know, that came into office and, you know, they decided because they were nice to make these changes. There have always been communities demanding change, communities demanding development. So if, if you want to talk about the consistency there, and maybe that's something that you can use as a type of jumping off point, uh, uh, is uh, the way in which the communities themselves engage in this process of seeking uh, 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 developmental change on their own behalf, right? And, and, I, and there's probably, uh, um, you know, not enough to be said about that particular uh, aspect of it. I hope that makes sense, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. Oh, okay. Matt, yeah. Dr. Bacher, I should have yeah. known. I should have known. What are you talking about? I Matt, thought you Dr. just Bacher. invited me to, uh, to ask you a question. I did, I did, I did. So I, I have to say that um, I showed up late. So uh, I did not, uh, other than the fact that you were calling me out of, uh, about uh, my pronunciation, mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I didn't hear uh, everything that you had to say, but um, I am intrigued by uh, something that you were highlighting in that last slide. Mm -hmm. um, and that has to do with this question of um, best practices and 
um, you know, what, uh, what some scholars might call uh, policy mobility. Mm. Um, and I know that you just said that uh, you were suspect of uh, even the, the very notion of like models right. um, here. Uh, but but I am intrigued, right? Because I think that what you're pointing to is a way that um, the contemporary, uh, uh, you know, global political dynamics in some ways uh, can uh, can indicate a a reversal of what we think of as the traditional uh, power dynamics in the global system, right? Where where we would think about um, the models and the more advanced capitalist societies being ones that would travel to less advanced societies, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and you're pointing out how uh, Medellin may offer an example to other parts of the world, right. even advanced capitalist societies, right? Um, but I, I guess I see a bit of a tension there between you highlighting that and also pointing to the way that like the success here relies on Medellin picking up this um, this model and then making it its, its own, right? And so that kind of challenges in some ways the very notion of a, of a best practice that would travel around the world and, um, and, and be implemented. And so I, I guess I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that tension. Um, I, I mean, very good question, as, as I would expect from my colleague, Matt, Dr. Barker. Uh, um, one of the ways I would address that would be to sort of focus on, like, uh, you know, the UN has this thing, you know, the, 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 the sustainable development goals. This is one of the things that you missed earlier because you were late, right? Uh, yes. But they have this, the, in, in association with the sustainable development goals, they have this thing called the new urban agenda, right? And one of the things associated with the new urban agenda, if you sort of, if you read it in a particular way, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a top down sort of thing where, where the UN uh, doing whatever the UN does uh, seeks to work with with local communities uh, in sort of uh, developing, uh, again, uh, best practices or acknowledging best practices. But another way of thinking about it would be to uh, see as important, uh, you know, the UN is acknowledging as important uh, and, prob and probably, you know, uh, vitally necessary, uh, the types of decisions that are made on a local level, right? And in the sense that, uh, you know, th these best practices uh, uh, for, in this instance, building, build, building cities and communities uh, probably uh, have to consider the types of situations or scenarios that local communities are faced with or dealing with uh, uh, wherever they're located around the world. In the sense that a top-down type of uh, discussion about this is the best way to you know, build resiliency or this is the best way to ensure uh, 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 housing equity uh, uh, could, could fall flat uh, uh, if you don't consider the actual circumstances that are on the ground in these various parts of the world where these policies and initiatives are going to be uh, circulating and hopefully making uh, having some effect, right? Uh, uh, so, so my perspective on it is that, uh, you know, the, these problems are global <clears throat> in terms of their significance, in terms of their scale and their scope, but it doesn't mean the solutions have to be. And in fact, some of the more workable solutions uh, might be those that are completely unique to a particular setting in a sense that it, it, we, it, I guess the answer is we don't know actually uh, what could or should work uh, given the, you know, the complexity of the issue in the sense that what worked in Medellin may not be directly translatable to South Africa or Brazil, or whatever the case may be, particularly because of some of the, the, the political sort of realities and the economic realities that, that many had going for it. But it doesn't mean that there aren't features of that model that aren't uh, in some way translatable. And again, I think one of the main features of that model had to do with community participation, right? So, so th this idea of, I think what the models should do is be respectful of the context and the circumstances of the, of the, of the, of the cities and communities, uh, uh, you know, in the various parts of the world where they might be useful. They need to be respectful of those contexts, right? Uh, they, you know, they need to be respectful of the histories in the sense that uh, equality or inequality as expressed in Brazil may not be the same as it is expressed in Johannesburg, right? Uh, you know, in terms of the way in which the, the city itself uh, has been shaped by inequality, right? Inequality may be a consistency between those two locations, but how it is expressed may be radically different, right? Thereby, the solutions, the solutions that you would come up with um, have to be, you know, tailor-made, I guess. Is that helpful? I don't know. You and I could talk about this all day, you know. No, absolutely. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, if not, thank you again for um, 
being here with us and for it was my pleasure it was wonderful to have you here and we just wanted to thank you again for those of you who came out here for international education week um, for this today's event if you are watching this later on on your own time thank you for tuning in but thank you again for attending thank you dr lindsay for being here my pleasure and we hope you all have a wonderful afternoon all right thank, thank you. you thanks thank everybody you.